This is Dan Bolden, and I'm the host of this podcast called The Courage to Be Courageous, a place where all can come and hear stories of people from all over the United States who face fear and have had the courage to get through their fear and be their authentic self. I hope you'll get some encouragement and some positive input in your life when you hear these stories. I want to invite... um, my guest today to an, what I call a legendary hero, Brian McNaught. And Brian and I met actually after I had read his book, the last one, I read both of them, but the last one was called Gay and Gray. I was so impressed with his story and the things he's done for the LBGTQ movement that I contacted him. And uh, I wanted to invite him on my podcast today I think you're going to find his story riveting. I think you're going to find it powerful. And I think you're going to find some real connection with it. And I think one thing that's uh, interesting for me on this story is that uh, Brian and I are in the same age, same age group. We're maybe, maybe one year apart. So we're raised in a generation where being gay was considered to be unthinkable. And yet Brian had the courage to be a courageous to come through that time when many of us were hiding in the closet or at least denying who we were. So, Brian, I want to welcome you to my podcast here and tell me a little bit about your history and your story, and I'll let you go from there. Okay. I uh, First, thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'm the middle child of seven Irish Catholics born in Detroit. Uh, I uh, 16 years of Catholic education. When I graduated from college in 1970, it was in the middle of the war in Vietnam, and I was a conscientious objector. Uh, The Selective Service um, uh, allowed my service to be at a Catholic newspaper, where I was a writer and a columnist. And in 1974, which was the the fourth year that I was at the paper, I wrote a column that said that being gay is as good as being straight. And um, I started it, which caused an enormous uproar in the archdiocese. Uh, The cardinal had every priest in the diocese read a letter from the pulpit saying that Brian McDonald is wrong, that homosexuality is not acceptable. Well, then um, I started the Detroit chapter of Dignity, which is a gay Catholic group. And I got a telephone call from the religion editor of the Detroit News saying, Brian, um, I'm doing a story on homosexuality and religion, and the diocese gave me your number. Uh, it was a friend of mine I hadn't yet come out to. So I, she said, well, you, um, can I interview you? And I said, sure. And uh, uh, so the next day, the Detroit News had a, a big story about homosexuality, religion, and they quoted me extensively um, about being gay and Catholic. And uh, so I went to work the following day and editor calls me into the office and says, we're dropping your column. I said, why? I said, you know, why? You said it was okay for for me to be gay. I took you all out to lunch. You all said it was fine. Well, we, we got phone calls over the, over the uh, overnight saying people got to cancel their advertising if they don't, if we don't do something about you. Hmm. So I sat back at my desk and, and a telephone call comes in. It was the same religion editor. And she says, Hey, has there been any response to my article? And I said, yeah, they just dropped my column. So the next day the Detroit news had eight column headline Catholic newspaper drops column by homosexual. And uh, oh, wow. at, so so Dan, at, at, so at age 26, I was uh, the homosexual, the practicing homosexual, the avowed homosexual, and uh, uh, and I, you know what, I I wasn't I wasn't afraid of uh, I was only afraid of being set up. I, I got a note uh, stuck in my door. Um, from a kid who said he was 12 years old and he lived down the block and would I meet him, you know, behind his house uh, at four o'clock. And I didn't because 
I knew that it was possible I was going to get entrapped. And I, and I had to be very careful from that moment on in my life to make sure that um, I was aware of my support and I was aware of my opposition. And uh, so uh, every newspaper, television station, radio station in Detroit and Michigan wanted to interview this gay guy who, um, whose father was director of General Motors Public Relations. Uh, they wanted to talk to this gay guy who didn't seem to fit people's expectations because, you know, at that time there was very few people who were gay and out. Very few. Very few. And so, and I was this su- surprising, you know, middle, upper middle class, well educated, um, well dressed, uh, faithful member of the church, uh, faithful member of my family who said that I was gay. And that uh, it, it just didn't make sense to some people. Uh, the first group that I was asked to go talk to, uh, and it started it with a, um, people in a, in a home Bible study class. And I came to the door in my new blazer and my khaki pants, and my mattress tie. And the woman at the door said, we're very glad you're here, Brian. But the lady in the green blazer says that she's going to throw up when you walk in the room. Now, that may sound absurd to an audience in 2023, but in 1974, it made perfect sense because people's images of homosexuals were disgusting. I mean, they had, they had no positive image. There was no positive people out there that on television or, or, or in the movies that you could point to and say, I want to grow up and be like him. So um, the lady in the green blazer was the last one to leave that night. And it was the first lesson that I got that um, I t- took with me my whole life, and that is that uh, uh, fear is the parent of hatred, uh, but ignorance is the parent of fear. And um, this woman was ignorant. She just was uneducated on homosexuality, as most people in the world were um, and may still be. And I was, you know, I was God's instrument as far as I was concerned. You know, I never took personal credit for the the minds and hearts that I changed over the past near 50 years. You know, I really saw myself as a a window through which the light shone. What a wonderful comment. Yes, the window by which the light shines. Right. I I, I was, you know, it came from, it came from a, a, a story about a priest quizzing the first graders. You know, who can tell me what a saint is? Little boy in the back room said, A saint's that thing that the light shines through. And I thought, Wow, what a great definition of being a saint. You know, uh, St. Francis of Assisi, you know, asked that, you know, let me be a channel of your peace. Let me be a channel. And that was, that guided me um, my whole life. In fact, Dan, I traveled the world, as I think you know. um, After I was fired for being gay, you know, they dropped my column and then they, and they fired me. I started getting invited to speak at college campuses uh, for 10 years. And I spoke at uh, two, over 200 college and university campuses. And then um, a, a corporation got in touch with me and said, we understand that you're doing these trainings for colleges. Would you um, put together one for us? And it was, I was the first person to be invited into a corporation uh, to talk about homosexuality. It was a diversity class. And somebody at uh, Belcor, which is the first one, was married to somebody at at and And over dinner, they talked about the success of the workshop. Well, then I got invited to at and And then Bell Labs and Motorola and Hewlett Packard. And it grew and grew and grew and grew. You know, my father and mother had a hard time initially with, uh, you know, my coming out and being so public. They weren't embarrassed by me. They, but they didn't know what to, how to explain me to people. Now, my mother said to me once, what do I tell people you do <laughs> for <a> living? <laughs> but they were supportive uh, of you, so, weren't they? You're dead. Yeah, we, we loved you, but we don't know how to describe you. I, so, I think one thing you shared with me, Brian, I want to make a comment, is that you, your parents raised you to have a belief 
and not just to be quiet, but if you have a belief and to express that. So they were supportive of you speaking for yourself and not having somebody else speak with you. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. Uh, Dan, I, uh, I, as we I talked in, um, before this, with my father being in public relations, all of us were expected to be able to hold our own. We were, uh, because um, famous people came to the house, not just the chairman of the board of General Motors, um, who at that time GM was the biggest corporation in the country and in the world, and, and the and the president chairman was like the pope <laughs> yes, coming to your right. house. Um, but also TV stars, you know, would come to, because they were doing advertising for Buick um, or other GM products. And um, so we learned to you know stand up, uh, have conversations not sit quietly in the corner. And uh, so when I started getting invited to speak to corporations and to U.S. government facilities, you know, I spoke at most of the um, high security, pl- like Los Alamos had me speak. You know, all the places that they did government research, they brought me in to speak. And, and that included the national, um, the NSA, uh, the National Security Agency. And, you know, when I was invited to the NSA, I was, you know, feeling my oats. I'd been out there a long time. I said, I'll come, but you have to mandate it. Because in the beginning, when I would go to a corporation, it would be like, you can come if you want to, right? And so I'd get a handful of people, half of which had gay kids, the other half were gay. And, you know, they loved my talk, but I wasn't reaching anyone who needed to be taught. So... I learned that, uh, you know, they have to either mandate it or there needs to be a letter from the, uh, an email from the president or CEO saying, I'm going to be at this talk and I hope to see you there. <laughs> so, you know, everyone would think I better show up or I'm going to be in trouble. So the, the audience at the NSA was packed and, um, and I got the first standing ovation, according to them. Uh, for this talk on uh, lesbian, what it's like to be gay. I mean, my story all over the world, you know, the banks took me to Mumbai and Singapore, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Australia, UK. Uh, my, what the most positive, important thing that I did was tell my story. And, um, and, and when you personalize it, you know, when you're, you're not talking statistics, you're not talking about other people, but, you know, when I was 20, uh, before I came out, uh, I drank a bottle of turpentine and took all the pills in the medicine cabinet and, um, you know, waited to die. Uh, but then I thought about my mom and my dad and how they had already lost three of the seven kids. Two didn't, you know, get past age two. So I quickly went down and had my stomach pumped at the Catholic hospital down the street. And as I sat on that emergency table, you know, with tubes down my nose and throat, I promised myself, and this is age 26, I was never going to live according to people's images or expectations of me. You know, um, I, 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 a Catholic magazine asked me to address the issue, are gay people part of God's plan? And I wrote that when I die, I imagine God will say to me, Brian, did you sing the song I taught you? And my first response to God would be, God, for 26 years, I didn't. I pretended that I was somebody other than who I was. I would sing, I am Brian, I'm a heterosexual. And then I drank the turpentine. And I changed my song. And my song became, I am Brian, I am gay, won't you accept me? Today, and that was that was the the, the the talk that I gave, you know, at all these college campuses. You know, you know, I wanted to have them see somebody who defied all their stereotypes. You know, uh, he was he was funny, you know, and and at the time he was good looking and he was articulate, uh, and you know that was really important to me. But then. Then this voice inside me said, you're not here to ask for their acceptance. That's not why you're on earth. Your song needs to be, I am Brian, I'm gay, I'm God's gift to you today. 
And that's a message that I really want to communicate to younger gay people and older gay people, transgender people, that um, we're, we're special. It, it doesn't mean that we're better than straight people, but we have gifts they don't have. And for 50 years and longer, we've been defending ourselves against oppression rather than uh, making the case and celebrating our gifts. And who we are, yeah. our gifts and who we who are. We, yes. yeah, who we are and what we bring to the table, right? Um, I, 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 yesterday, you would love this. Yesterday, I was in a really tiny, somebody rear-ended our car, and I was in a really tiny um, enterprise office. All the seats were taken, two people behind the counter. So this woman asked me when I was filling out the form, she said, what's your occupation? And I said, um, I'm a writer. And she said, uh, oh, what have you written? And I said, well, I've written 13 books, but they've all been on um, LGBT." issues and um they everyone's eyes lit up <laughs> so this mother this woman came over and sat next to me and she said my oldest son is pansexual my daughter is lesbian and my youngest son is gay he just came out he's in high school and and she said i'm proud of all of them and i'm excited they were able to name themselves well that's you know that's brand new. Wow. I mean, that you know, is parents, I said, do you know, I said, do you know that, you know, 45, 50 years ago, when I would speak on a campus, uh, uh, there would always be a line of people who wanted to talk afterwards, maybe sign my book or just talk to me. And often a parent would whisper to me, my son is gay. And I, you know, and I would say, because at the time it was really scary, you know, I would say, okay. I said, now I've got an organization that I want you to join. It's called uh, Parents and Friends of Lesbian and Gays, PFLAG. And there are books that really helped my parents understand. And these are the titles of the books. And uh, here's, you know, here's my phone number. Here's my address. You know, get in touch with me. Have your child get in touch with me. Now, when a parent comes up to me and says, my child is gay, I say, oh, my God, you got the golden ticket from Willy Wonka's Chicago Factory. You are so <laughs> lucky. And, and they would say, you know, I, see, they'd say, lucky? And I'd say, yes. I said, you're going to meet people you never would have met before. You're going to eat food that you never would have tasted before. You're going to be in situations that your heterosexual life never would have brought you to because you've got a gay kid. And because gay people have special gifts, you know, it is not a coincidence. You know, people say, oh, if they're gay, they're florists or they're interior decorators or they're hairstylists, right? Well, all of those, all of those professions are about making things and people beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, many, many, many of us gay men have this innate gift of being able to see the beauty and to translate it, you know, that's why an inordinate number of people who write children's books, right? Like Marie Sendak and Tommy DePaula were gay. Hans Christian Andersen, gay. Mm -hmm. huh? Throughout history, they had all these people and also people who would write plays and songs, right? About what they saw in the world, gay. So many of them were gay. I think it was Annie Leibovitz who said, if you removed every gay person from the arts, you'd be left with, let's make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> and it wouldn't be a great deal either. <laughs> no, it wouldn't be. It would be this TV show would be the only one on because there are so many gay writers of comedy and so many gay comedians and uh, so many women, you know, who... Uh, weren't able to identify themselves as gay, but, you know, they transformed our concept of gender. You know, I, I say uh, that uh, the women's movement, particularly back with uh, um, uh, the, the early suffragettes, they, they challenged uh, the role that women had in society. They said, we're not, we deserve a vote, which was unheard of. 
And we deserve to be able to work in the factories, which was unheard of, right? And that's what happened after World War II. All the women were in the, in the factories when the men came home. So that preceded the gay movement, and it opened up the air to the idea that your concept of what is natural isn't reliable, right? People would say about gay people, well, it's unnatural. Okay, what's your, what, what are you using as your barometer of nature, right? Mm-hmm. In every species of mammal, there is homosexuality. Every species, there's not an exception. So what's your, what's your, what, it, tell me what you mean by mm-hmm. natural. Mm-hmm. Right. Good questions. Good questions. One time I was on a plane, Dan, and you'll love this because you grew up in a very conservative religion. My religion was conservative, but your religion was far more conservative than mine was. Oh, I, I, right? I, I don't know if I'd even say conservative. I, I would even go further than that. It was so restrictive and so controlled. There wasn't a room, there it, wasn't room for it, anyone to be their authentic it self, was male or female, a gay yeah, or repressive. heterosexual. Repressive, that's the perfect word for it. Yeah. Yes. So I get on a plane. I, at the time, we lived in Atlanta. And, and Ray, my, my husband of 47 years, uh, Ray at the time was in the openly gay uh, uh, manager of the Lehman office in Atlanta, right? So we live in Atlanta. I did a couple workshops back to back up in New York. I'm flying back to Atlanta. I sit next to this guy and uh, we start talking, you know, I like to talk with people and, uh, he said, uh, so what do you do for a living? And I said, well, you, you, you tell me first, what do you do? You know, who are you? He said, well, I'm best known as being a fundamentalist Christian um, leader in the workplace. I talk to people about moral issues in the workplace. I said, oh, he said, yeah, I received one of President Bush's Thousand Point of Light Award. I was in Inc. Magazine and Fortune Magazine, you know, so, but enough about me. He said, you know, of course, there's this big bubble over my head of all the seats in the plane. You had to pick this one. So, <laughs> so he said, what, he said, what about you? You know, what do you do? And I said, well, I teach in corporations about being gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender. <laughs> and of course, there was a big bubble over his head. This said, of all the seats on the plane, I have to choose this one. So he said, <laughs> he said, I don't, you know, I don't understand what, what, I don't understand why they would have you come in. I don't understand how it's even related to the workplace. I said, okay, let's pretend you're gay and you come into work one day and on your computer is this piece of paper that says Leviticus 18.22, a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman, such is an abomination. I said, how would you feel when you saw that? He said, I'd be pissed. He said, I, you know, first of all, I'd want to know who did it. I'd, I'd want to know who around me, you know, not only knew I was gay, but wanted to put me down for being gay. And I said, okay, and how much work would you get done that day? He said, I wouldn't get any work on that day. <laughs> he said, I'd be so focused on the audacity of somebody to do that. I said, that's why they have me come in. See, because they, you know, in this war for talent, that every corporation is in a war for talent. Uh, everyone, they, they have to create a place where everyone feels safe and valued, right? So my job is to make sure that in every corporation, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender people feel safe and valued, right? And, and, you know, in the beginning, I I would mostly speak to these uh, geniuses at Bell Labs and elsewhere. And I, you know, I reminded them of the story of Alan Turing. Alan Turing was the founder of the modern computer. He was the man who during World War II, on his own, broke the German code and saved hundreds of thousands of lives because we could then find out what the Germans were up to in terms of plans to torpedo or whatever. Alan Turing, and and he reported a robbery at his home one day and the police came and discovered by looking at what he had around the house that he was homosexual and he was taken to court for being a homosexual. 
And the court uh, ordered a castration by chemicals, right? Oh my! So they gave him estrogen, the female, the female hormone. And Alan Turing, who was an athlete, started to develop breasts. And he was so, so upset by what had been done to him, this genius, that he ate a cyanide-laced apple. And he died. And I would say to the people at Bell Labs, I, I would say, where would we be today if Alan Turing had not died? What more might we know? And they all, you know, they all knew of his name, and they all nodded their head, um, as did the people at the National Security Agency. But anyway, going back to the guy next to me on the plane, he said, oh, he said, well, what do you do in your workshop? And I, felt, I said, you know, the most powerful thing I do is tell my story. And he said, oh. He said, well, why don't you tell me your story? I've never met a homosexual. I said, I think you have. You know, <laughs> they just didn't tell you. They, they didn't tell you. Yeah, they were yeah. hidden in the closet. But, yeah, right. So yeah. I'll tell you. I, I'm I'll, I'm gay. I'm proud of being gay, um, and I have been since I came out. I said, uh, what I do is tell my story. He said, tell me your story. So I told him my story. You know, growing up, the paint thinner, losing my job, going on a hunger fast for 24 days. Um, Speaking here, death threats, you know, in my one over my mailbox one time in Boston when I was a mayor's liaison at a gay community, there was this there was this big message over my mailbox, get out of town, McNaught, I hope you die of AIDS. Right. So I'm telling him all this. I'm telling him about Ray and he asked me questions like, Well, have you had sex with a woman? Yes, it did nothing for me. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't I couldn't even get it an erotic response. So he'd listen, 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 and, my, and how are your parents? Well, my parents love me and support me. And at the end, he said, Brian, as sure as I'm sitting in this seat, I know God had you sit next to me. And I will never again think about gay people in the same way. That's a fascinating comment. And, you know, it made me think of something you told me yesterday, Brian. And I think it's really a key thing. You talked about homophobia. And obviously, right. he'd had some homophobia. And you said there's three reasons that people are homophobic. And this is outstanding. Would you share that with our audience? Sure. I mean, I didn't make this up. It's not my study. Um, I think it's Greg Herrick's study, uh, university study. He said there were three sources of homophobia. Now, re- remember, um, homophobia is different than heterosexism. Um, yes. We'll talk about both of them. Yes. Homophobia is the fear and hatred, right, of homosexuals. Fear and hatred. And um, and there are three sources, according to the study. The first is, when you were a child, a person of the same gender touched you inappropriately, right? And as you grew up, you associated pedophilia which was a, you know, an adult touching a, a, a prepubescent child, you associated that with homosexuals. And so you assumed all homosexuals touched children, right? All homosexuals were um, deviant. That's number one. Number two is that you're afraid not to believe it. You're afraid because all of the people around you, like members of your church, Right, Dan? Yes. Or the Mormons or the police force or the armed forces. They're afraid to put their hand up and say, I support gay people because what will happen is a result. They'll lose the friendship of everybody around them. Right. Yes. And they're they afraid will. of doing this, especially in the in the um, you know, if you're in the army, you want the guy in the foxhole next to you, you know, to not hate you, not to be resentful, so you do what you have to do in order to fit in, at least at the time. And the third source, and this is the biggest one, this is the one that um, I believe, you know, is the most pervasive. The person who can't deal with their own same-sex attractions, right? They may have heterosexual attractions too, but they're, they're really, really bothered by the fact that they find themselves if even occasionally attracted to somebody in the same sex. 
I don't want to be a fag. I don't want to be a homo. I, you know, that's not me. You know, you know, often these are the guys who stop, you know, the truck drivers who stop at rest stops, right. Mm -hmm. And allow themselves to receive uh, oral sex. But they're the man and the person who did it is the woman as far as they're concerned. You know, even in, even in cultures, black culture, sometimes Latino cultures, they, they, they don't say, are you gay? They say, have you ever had man on man sex? Because none of them will say they're gay, but they will admit that they've had sex with another man. Do you understand the distinction? I do. I understand that. Isn't that, that's, it, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. But heterosexism is per, more pervasive. So heterosexism is if you and I were partners, Dan, and we were invited to your sister's wedding, right? We wouldn't dance together because we wouldn't want to ruin her wedding. That's heterosexism true. is the assumption that heterosexuality is superior to homosexuality. The same thing, it's just like sexism. Sexism is the belief that males are superior to females. Racism is the belief that white people are superior to people of color. Well, heterosexism is, and it's two things. One, it's the belief that either nature's intention or God's intention was to be heterosexual. And if you were homosexual, something went wrong, right? So you, and parents blame themselves for having homosexual children. You know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't a good enough father. I doted on him too much as my mother. They keep coming up with these reasons that they have gay kids, but it's all in our DNA. It's all in the, in the hormones that we get um, in, in, as fetuses in our brain development. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with what happens once we leave the womb. And, 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 right? I, and I know that. I know that when I was seven years old, I was different. I didn't know anything about sex. I know that I like boys. I was different, right. and I knew nothing about that. I know that I was born... As an, and when I, when I came out of the womb, I was born, even though I didn't know it, I was born gay. For people say it's a choice. In my case, in the case of you, Brian, and everyone who is gay, it is not a choice. And yet people still try to tell us, well, you chose that. Who would yeah. choose that when there was so much opposition against us? It wasn't right. a choice that we would make. A and television talk show host asked me one time. He said, Brian, when did you decide to be gay? <laughs> and I said, oh, it was one day when that I thought it would be wonderful to be um, thrown out of the house by my parents, lose my job, right, and get kicked out of the church. I thought it would be really fun to have mm -hmm. those yeah. three experiences. <laughs> and, you know, audiences laugh when I tell them that. I think, you know, what are you thinking? Well, you know, why would you think that with all the opposition, you know, with gay guys getting beaten up. And you know what, Dan? Gay guys don't get beaten up by one guy, one heterosexual. There are four or five of them On who do it. Of them, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's four against one, and they think they're manly because they were be able to beat up one guy. No? Mm -hmm. It's so stupid. But at any rate, I. And, and it so also is ignorant. Thing, it's also ignorant, too. Stupid yeah, and it, ignorant. You know, both. Ignorance is a parent of fear. Mm -hmm. When I say Correct. ignorant, I don't mean illiterate. Mm -hmm. I mean that you don't know about this particular subject. Mm -hmm. And when I teach you, it changes everything, right? And when you come out, you know, if what, coming out of the closet and putting a face on the issue is what has transformed the culture around the world in the last 50 years, right? Gay pride is celebrated in Thailand, in Hong Kong, in India, in Japan, obviously the UK, Ireland, France, Italy, and many of them call it Stonewall because of our of the bar that was raided, the Stonewall yeah, bar yeah. raided in 1969 Jeez. by the police, um, and and the in in the and the patrons fought back. They threw pennies. Everyone threw pennies at the coppers. It was supposed to be funny. You know, the copper penny at the coppers. So, mm -hmm. and the police ended up barricading themselves inside the Stonewall Bar and it went on for three days. Well, all over the world people are celebrating this and we did this. You know, 
those of us who put our faces out there for people to see. And, and you know, when the Supreme Court um, acknowledged that, uh, that, that gay people had a right to be married, that didn't happen in a vacuum. That happened because the friends of the Supreme Court people were people who had gay kids. The Supreme Court people went to church where people like me had already done work with the congregation. So the congregation declared itself welcoming. So all these politicians have family members and friends and go to churches and country clubs where they have they meet people whose sons and daughters have come out. Right. Before, no one knew a homosexual. You know? I, I would ask an audience in the beginning, how many of you know somebody who's gay? And of course, you know, in the beginning, 10% would raise their hand. I'm saying, the rest of you know somebody gay, you just don't know you know them. Uh, and when I'm, <laughs> finished with this work, when I'm finished with this workshop, you'll be able to raise your hand. I believe <laughs> that too. And, yeah. you know, and I have to commend you, um, Brian, and I, I have so much respect and so much courage. You have legendary courage you have come out when it in the generation that i know of because you and i are in the same generation yep. it was hum, it was embarrassing humiliating you would do everything you can to stuff who you are for fear that you may be beaten or you lose your life or in your job or whatever but you were or a they triumph. set your house on fire or you know you were a triumph you were one of the very few people in my generation and that's the reason you've done so much work for our community by the talks and the 49 years of coming out and i can tell you that my hats off to you and i will always yeah. remember your stories and i remember because you fought for gay rights when the worst when the rest of us were covering ourselves and burying yeah. it for whatever reason we buried it and you took the courage to step out become courageous get through your fear and move forward and you've done that for years and years and years i want to just one one more comment i want to we talked okay. about this yesterday because to show you the type of fear that brian has been through share come experiences where you were given threats and your life was in danger because I think this is so powerful to show how much courage Brian had knowing that he could have been killed, shot, or whatever. There's a couple of things you told me that I thought were very, very powerful. Could you share a couple of those with us? Sure. In the very beginning, back in you know May of 74, uh, after I started Dignity and after the newspapers talked about me being gay, um, a chapter of Dignity in Flint, Michigan, I was in Detroit, um, in Flint, where I actually grew up, invited me to come up and speak to their organization. And um, they opened it to the public and a death threat was made. Somebody said they were going to bring a gun to the church and, and shoot me. And, you, you know, as Dan, as we talked yesterday, we, you and I grew up in a generation of people being assassinated. Yes. You know, that, it was normal. Mm -hmm. It was, shouldn't be normal, but it was normal. You know, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Malcolm X, John, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Medgar Evers, all these people um, were, sh were shot dead because people were afraid of their messages, right? So I went up to Flint and I did the talk anyway. I, you know, I thought, Look, if you want to shoot me, shoot me. But, you know, I've, I've got a story to tell and I have work to do and I can't be intimidated by you. And, and then I got invited. This was a, a while later. I got invited to speak at Northern Michigan University. That's up in the Upper Peninsula. And, um, and the people who invited me, you know, people were in the, you know, in the staff of the university. They, they called me and they said, Brian, we don't know. Maybe we should cancel this. There's been a death threat made against you. You know, are you sure you want to come? Absolutely. I said, you, you do not want to be the university where Brian McNaught was killed. <laughs> that is, every, you know, everyone thinks of Kent State, you know, as a, as a place where they, the, the National Guard shot all the students dead during the demonstrations against who wants to say it happened at their school. So I said, um, I'm coming and, and my safety is your responsibility. Now, see, you think, wow, where did you get the chutzpah to say something like that? Again, my faith, 
on believing in the message of Jesus in terms of the Sermon on the Mount, right, and the Beatitudes, and um, growing up in this family in which, you know, it was not unusual to get up at a wedding and sing you know, at the reception. Uh, so, uh, so I went, I went up there and the, the, the message was, uh, they, they said that the threat was coming from somebody in ROTC. So the um, head of ROTC went into all the, uh, met with all the ROTC members and said, look, I'm going to be at his talk tonight. And uh, if I see any of you there acting out in any way, you're going to pay for it. And they had undercover police in the little you know, little airport that I arrived in, undercover police at the event. And, um, you know, nothing happened. In fact, I, I got the audience laughing. You know, I told them, you know, the three sources of, of homophobia. And I said, you know, so the first guy, the third one being that you're afraid that you're gay. I said, so the first guy who boos me, I want you to look at him and understand what he's going through. And of course, the women <laughs> cheered. They thought that was the funniest thing in the world. Well, Brian, you know, we you have you have been such a hero for us, and I want to thank you for that. I know our time is running out right now, and I want to have another podcast with you in the future. There are so many stories that we talked about yesterday that we didn't have time to talk about. I hope my listeners will listen to um, Brian's and our podcast today and draw something uh, spiritual from it, draw something that you can um, hang on to with your own fear, that you can use some courage to get through your own fear because that's what it takes to be your authentic self. Brian, thank you so much for being my guest today. And let's do it again very soon. I look forward to it, Dan. Thank you. You're welcome. And thank you again. Bye now.